Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. I'm here with uh, Super Agent Lee Steinberg. The book is The Agent that he has out now. Uh, we talked about Richard Sherman when you were walking in during the commercial. You made a good point that, you know, he's a guy, bright guy, went to Stanford, knows exactly what he's doing, made himself the biggest story, a Super Bowl week. But um, if a client does something like that, how, how, how long before you call him and just talk about how he feels about what just happened? But. Well, here's the thing. Richard Sherman is a, got good grades at Stanford. Right. And Hard to do. this was his plan, clearly. Right. I mean, if you think about it, it's he looked unhinged on the front of the Daily News today. But it evoked Miley Cyrus twerking to me. <laughs> In other words, clearly there were a bunch of people offended who thought it was horrible, but it launched your career. We're about to see 3,500 uh, writers descend on this city. Yep. The Super Bowl is the premier marketing event in America, and those players who perform dramatically in that, I remember I had Troy Aikman, and he was a very good quarterback. So in 1993, he is MVP of the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And we were on a limo driving home, and I said, Troy, do you realize what happened? He said, yeah, we won the game. <laughs> and I said, well, you're right, but you're now Troy Aikman, exactly. name and lights, and your life is never going to be the same. It's different, yeah. So the players that play dramatically and also interview well this next week vault themselves, transcend the narrow genre of hardcore sports fans and become household names. I just, I mean, yeah. it's something you probably do. We gotta, we gotta take a break, but can you stay another segment for us? Sure. Uh, the, uh, I, you know, I just hate the hypocrisy of, you know, a network saying they're offended by that or something. That's exactly what they want. It's football, it's theater. Now it's a story, uh, you know. In the same way they want bad weather for the Super Bowl. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk to you about that, too. All right, we're going uh, to take a break. Lee's uh, going to be uh, nice enough to stick around another segment. Uh, so we'll be back right after this. Lee Steinberg. Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. My guest is Lee Steinberg, uh, author of the book, The Agent, the super sports agent, legendary guy. Is that your version of 3D? <laughs> that's, yeah. as, that's as good as we get. <laughs> but um, so we talked on the way out briefly about the, the decision to have the Super Bowl in a cold weather city outside. I mean, it's not just any city. It's New York. First of all, what were your initial thoughts and what are they now on having it here? And you actually think maybe they're rooting for bad weather. You know? Oh, I do. When I talk to people from television, even writers, yeah. they're thinking... The writers, for sure, yeah. Th they love it. They, it's romantic. It's anarchy, chaos, yeah. and, and adverse uh, conditions. Um, <laughs> it's the Super Bowl. They rotate it, so once about every four years, it, and it goes to Detroit, it goes to Indianapolis, it goes to cold-weather cities. I remember Minnesota, <laughs> and that was really sir. tough. So, first of all, here's the thing. If you remember the Dallas Super Bowl, yeah. it was a mess mm -hmm. because, first of all, they had snow all over the street, and then uh, they had blue flu, right. and people couldn't get anywhere. Um, it's New York, so it's going to be exciting. It's going to be bigger than big. This city will be invaded uh, it's going to be crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in Hoboken, which is right in between the stadium and the city. So I'm going to be like on lockdown. It's going to be crazy. There's parties all over the place. But, you know, there's a lot of inconvenience. That a lot of New Yorkers are just getting out of town, you know. Well, we have our party on the Saturday prior. So this is my 26th annual one. Wow, that'd be And great. the Super Bowl, if you will, is a convention of Americana. It's much more than a game. You have big business taking over hotels. You have political figures. You have entertainment figures. It's the con uh, conflation of all those it's Everything, worlds. yeah. We mix them all together. We're doing a thing this year where we're going to have a live screen hookup between the party and troops in the field in Afghanistan. Oh, good for you. And so I'm going to play Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> and then we'll have different people uh, talk to him. You can do your stand-up. And... <laughs> that'll be fun. Yes. That'll, that'll get you thrown off the air very quickly. <laughs> uh, do you think it's important It's for... our channel. We can't oh, okay. be thrown off the air. <laughs> well, you'll throw me off the air, bro. What, um, do you think it's important for an agent to be a lawyer? Do you think that's a if a if a, uh, an entertainment person or a, or a sports person is going to hire an agent? Do you think that agent being a, also a lawyer is a big deal? So let's separate it into two things. There's nothing particularly I learned in law school right. that 
applied to this. The most important skill I ever learned was psychology. Mm -hmm. It was creating enough space, listening, not just persuasion, to allow people to show me their deepest anxieties and fears and their greatest hopes and dreams. So if you can put your head into another person's heart and mind and see the world the way that they see it, you can solve virtually any problem right. instead of just seeing it the way you see it. Um, you got to so be open-minded. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so I didn't really learn anything particularly compelling in law school, but to the outside world, it's a label, it's a uh, it's good housekeeping seal of approval. The best uh, degree is when they do a JD MBA and mm -hmm. do a joint. Those right. people have it uh, sort of going. Yeah. But so, as far as negotiating contracts and that sort of thing, it's it's definitely part of the... I, you have to be able to... We, we well, you need lawyers working for you, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, in, foot, in sports, we use standard player contracts. So I'd like to tell you um, how inventive we are, but unless you sign that <laughs> language, yeah. they're not approving the contract. Uh. And now, in the old days, I was, it was really creative in football. I, I came up with voidable years and void buyback and broke the 93 cap to smithereens. Today... My young daughter could do a football contract. Really? Every single player has to sign a four-year contract. Right. And then at the end of it, if you're drafted in rounds three through seven, and you've played 35% of the plays in the first three years or the last year, they escalate your fourth year up to, well, the figure this year is a million three two. Now, if you're in the first round, you sign a four-year contract, but after three the team has the option to re uh, to extend you for a fifth year. And the way they figure that one out, what you get, <laughs> is if you're in the top ten picks in the first round, you get the average of the one through ten veteran players best paid at the position. Now, if you're in the 11 through 32, you get the average of the top 25. So for the first four or five years, there's virtually no negotiability. I went back to the uh, agent seminar, and they've got a clause, and the fellow from the podium said, this is a Steinberg clause, okay? No <laughs> voids, no vote, by, by, no escalators, no this and that. That's so, great to have clauses there, Beth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's Santa Claus, probably, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you're like Santa Claus with a lot of players, I'm sure. Yeah. What the, I got to ask you this. You know, baseball, the steroid era, if you're A-Rod's agent, what, what advice do you give him at this point? What, um, what do you tell that guy? To try and retire with some dignity. All right. Because, first of all, Everyone misses the point that steroids are actually bad for you. Mm -hmm. John came into the NFL well after it had sort of run its course, but I had these massive linemen using steroids. They would go through behavioral cycles, up, down, up, down. We had a player on the Raiders kill himself because right. they come off of it, and it's bad for your health. So, And if they use it, kids are going to use it because they're going to try to do what they're doing. Artie, that's the whole point. Right. So we testified in front of a Senate committee in California. Here, here's the problem. In high school, you got two groups. you got athletes who will do anything to be bigger, stronger, faster. Then you have non-athletes who weight lift right. and, and want to be all buffed, and they'll do the same thing. And um, it's athletes trigger imitative behavior yeah. when i had lennox lewis cut a public service announcement that said real men don't hit women <laughs> it could do more to influence um uh adolescents attitudes towards domestic violence than 20 authority figures could you know i, I know a lot of the, you know charles barkley with that famous thing i'm not a role model but what you just said that i totally agree with if a kid has nothing to 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 look uh to look up at as a role model, except his dad, who does hit his mother. That Lennox Lewis thing then becomes a very important thing because it gives him someone else who he might look up to, to, to say, hey, that guy doesn't do stuff like that. It's, so it makes it, a big difference in that kid's life. I think. Especially if you take a big macho uh, player. Right. So when I had uh, Steve Young and Oscar De La Hoya do a, a public service announcement that said prejudice is foul play, mm -hmm. um, we're using athletes now to try and stop the bullying trend because in the infrastructure of, the, of a high school, it's the athletes at the top of that social structure. If they're willing to tell people not to p 
pick on somebody because of their looks or their ethnicity or their nerdiness, right, right. Um, whatever it is, then um, it, you know it sets a trend, especially if they're not the ones doing the bullying. Yeah, I hate to put I you. No, go ahead, John. Go. Uh, I have a couple questions. Go right ahead, man. No, go ahead. Um, do you have? I mean, what a different experience uh, I would imagine uh, we would be having if we were talking to a guy. Drew Rose, Drew, Drew Rosenhaus. Yeah, well, there's another guy I wanted to ask about. Another, yeah, like along the lines of, of Boris uh, being disliked. Right. I think uh, I don't think I'm in the minority not disliking Drew Rosenhaus just because of the way it seems like he conducts himself. Do you know him? Have you had interactions with him? And uh, how <laughs> well, have yeah, I how's don't that gone? criticize other agents. I mean, that's uh, self-serving. I was on uh, a television show with him. And uh, we, when I wrote Winning with Integrity, Drew had a book out also. And it was self-titled, The Shark Never Sleeps. <laughs> uh, case closed. Winning. <laughs> That's what you know. Winning with Integrity, <laughs> The Shark Never Sleeps. Yeah, there's a... Uh, did, did, <laughs> <laughs> did you ever, did you ever, uh, you don't have to name names unless you want to, but did you ever through negotiations uh, develop a lifelong enemy in your life? Like oh. on a personal level? That does it, did it ever get that far? Mike Brown of the Cincinnati Bengals <laughs> was nature's way of telling me I was too yeah. successful. Yeah. <laughs> I had the first round draft pick of that team in 1987, 92, 90. Uh, four, where I had the first player in the draft, 95, and then 99. If I was representing astronauts, <laughs> he would be commissioner of the moon. <laughs> and um, um, now, when he didn't need the player, he was hell on wheels. Okay. Uh, one day I walked in, and I had a player out of camp, and I said, this isn't good, Mike, you know. Uh, well, what if we compromise? He said, Lee, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. You lose. Oh, God. Wow. That was the end of that. It's a guy you're not going to have a barbecue with. <laughs> well, what about, what about uh, owners that you have the best relationship with? Um, I like owners like uh, uh, Bob Kraft, Jerry Jones, uh, the people who own the Dodgers. They have done so much in terms of broadening out marketing, being imaginative, being open, and all the rest of it. Now, on the other hand, I love uh, the Rooney family. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a story. Ben Roethlisberger was hurt one game. They needed the next game to get to the playoffs. And there was a lot of pressure to play him. And Dan called me and he said, we're, we're not playing him. This, he's our franchise quarterback for years. You know, if we don't win this season, we don't win. But, you know, we need to do the things for the long term. Yeah. Now, that's a... That's a that's, an, that's an, pretty incredible. An intel, yeah. Yeah. Intelligent owner. I m remember I was once sitting with Bob Kraft, and Parcells had Drew Bledsoe in the game in the fourth quarter that the Niners were blowing out the uh, Patriots. Right. And his arm was hanging down Drew's he had a separated shoulder and I said do you see they're hitting him over and over again um, how does that make sense and after that he got a phone line down to the coach wow yeah I, you know I had the, I was lucky enough to work for Bob Kraft once I did stand up at his home at a private party and he could not be a classier nicer guy that guy um, listen I could talk to you all night but uh, I, we got to go I really appreciate coming in Lee anytime you want to come by yeah. Let us know. Again, it's Lee Steinberg. The book is The Agent. And uh, much luck with it and continued success, all right? My pleasure. Yeah, thank you very Lee, much. Lee Steinberg. The great Bonnie Bernstein is next after this. The Artie Lang Show, weeknights on audience, only on DirecTV.